This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 546, recorded on May 3rd, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. What county is that in? Bergen? Bergen. It's not a nice day today, is it? It's kind of yucky out there. It's meh. M-E-H. It's meh. It's gray. It's gray. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. How are you? We're well. We are well. We are um, well. I'm trying to see if I can give you any weather report. Uh, it's kind of <laughs> cold. I just when I walked back from graduation, exactly. I wished I had mittens. Feels like 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Really? Oh my. Um, windy, cold. What's, what's yeah. that doing to the tulips? Oh, they're they're hanging in there. No problem for them. All right. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's pretty similar here. Light rain, 56 Fahrenheit, 13 C. Just blech. Yeah. That's B L E C H. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us from, uh, I'm not sure where, Rich Condit. Uh, it's Austin, Texas. Hi, everybody. Oh, you're in Austin. Hey, Rich. I thought you were in I Florida. Am, I was, but I'm back. When did you get uh, back? Uh, that's a good question. I got back Tuesday <laughs> evening. Oh, because it was a quick trip. It okay. was my. It was a retirement party for my buddy Nisin Musachi. Right. Oh, oh, nice! Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, I took the opportunity to visit my brother on Amelia Island, so it was a nice trip. Cool, very cool. And saw all the old gang, which is always Love it. fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it is seventy-five degrees and overcast. We're uh, <laughs> in a very that's twenty-four C. We're in a brief respite from a couple of days long period of rain we're expecting more this evening and then it's going to brighten up over the weekend so that's where we're at and i would say uh it's okay you know there's just no point in complaining about the weather there's really no point yeah we don't i'm not totally agree. you're right no no i'm not complaining if you like uh twiv consider supporting us go to microbe.tv slash contribute a number of ways that you can say give us a buck a month. Great deal. You get a lot of different podcasts besides TWIV. Less than a cup of coffee. Microbe.tv slash contribute. This episode is sponsored by the 2019 Chem Bio Defense Science and Technology Conference. Are you working on innovative research that can shape the future of chemical or biological defense? If so, submit your abstract and present your work to more than 1,500 leaders from government, academia, and industry. Visit cbdstconference.com for more details. It's all one word, cbdstconference.com. Where is it? Good question. Visit cbdstconference.com <laughs> for more details. It's a n- 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 I don't know where it is. <laughs> uh, Let's see if I look down at the longer thingy. Chernobyl. No, I don't know. Having it in Chernobyl. It's a good question. <laughs> I'm just I'm just bringing up the page now. <laughs> I am back from Rotterdam. I was at ECV 2019 this week. A shout out to all the fans that I met there. Lots of people listening. Cool. Uh, and that is a country where they use Celsius <laughs> for everything. That's yeah. true. It's lovely to be there. Like most I? of the world. By the way, the <laughs> CBDST conference is in Cincinnati in November. Hmm. Which is in Ohio. Yes. And um, let's see, what did I want to tell you about Rotterdam? It was very interesting. Today's papers, in fact, were all because I heard about them at the meeting. That's why we're talking about them. And I also heard about a cool resource that many of you are going to like. It is the European Virus Archive. Hmm. It's a nonprofit network of of academic virology biobanks. It's been around for 10 years. And they give viruses out. They have over 1,700, as well as derived products, like nu- reagents for diagnosis, nucleic acids, proteins, and antibodies. They even have services. They will train you to work in BSL-3-4 facilities. My goodness. 
So you can get their products. They distribute worldwide, and uh, they've distributed over 2,000 products to 500 teams in 66 countries, free of charge. They will just charge you shipping, and it's, you can do it all online. And, of course, you have to have adequate BSL containment, and uh, every inquiry is reviewed for biosafety and biosecurity. Those are two words you should know, understand now because of last yes. week's TWIP. But this so is the European a, Virus Archive is neither strictly European nor strictly about viruses. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> what? It's well, called SNL. He says it's worldwide and it's got all these other things. Worldwide so is it is things. it sort of like what the ATCC I would say it's would like, have been if we could give them viruses? I'd say it's more <laughs> like uh, BEI, right? Which is was set up by the CDC here. And if you have an, NIH, and, yeah. if you have an NIH grant, um, that you can get stuff for them for just shipping. But uh, according to the European Virus Archive people, they have some things that BEI doesn't, and vice versa. So you might want to check it out if you're looking for something, regardless of where you are. Yes, but of course they will check you, make sure you have the yes, right biosecurity level. You will be vetted, even if it's a human virus. Yeah, but anyway, it is um, an interesting resource which I was not aware of, so check it out. You might, and they asked me to spread the word, so we are spreading it. Speaking of word, what's happening with ASV? Well, it's, we are now in May, and May 15th is when early bird registration ends. So if you register before May 15th, you will save money. Also, May 13th is the deadline for ASV CARES applications. That's for people who want to get dependent care during the meeting. Um, as we described, you could have that be somebody coming to your home or bring a caregiver to the meeting, whatever. But you need to apply by May 13th, and funds are still available for that. You apply through the member site at www.asv.org. Okay, it's that time of year. Boy, before you know it, the meeting will be here. Mm -hmm. I registered yesterday. Good for you. And where is ASV this year? Minneapolis. Minneapolis. There you go. There you go. Minneapolis. Home and, of the uh, G three building. The what? Oh yeah, that's that wooden thing, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll go see it while I'm there. That would be interesting. All right, we have one follow up from B Yorn. Heavy rains, quote, heavy rains in July probably overwhelmed the drainage system, washing live virus into the open through poorly sealed drain covers, concludes the HSE. Faulty pipe blame for UK foot and mouth outbreak. In your recent episode about biosecurity, you collectively, but most vocally, Alan Dove said you didn't know about any recent accidents from laboratories with high containment levels. That made me remember this incident from 2007 where a faulty pipe in the UK's Port and Down facility led to an outbreak of foot and mouth disease. It has happened before. It will probably happen again, but hopefully very rarely. P.S. The episode was excellent. Jens Kuhn is fantastically knowledgeable and very good at explaining. So I guess it depends on what we call recent. So what is recent anyway? Is it 2007 was 12 years ago. Ask, you know. ask Bill Clinton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, True. I thought of this incident while we were talking about it. And, yeah. you know, I think of a lot of things while we're talking on Twitter. And sometimes I figure I don't want to interrupt and add no, more. No, I, I remember you know. this one, too. So know. I didn't mention it. But, yeah, we know about that. We we did an episode or two on this. We I, we covered this, as I recall. Probably. I think so. You know, now at four, 546 episodes, we've covered a lot. The waterfront. Indeed. And the, Indeed. the real key is to try and figure out a way – to make it all more accessible, it's not really at the moment. So I, I don't know. How, I'm I'm thinking about how to do that, but well, you know, the titles the titles certainly don't help. No, the titles don't help. <laughs> That's you know you have to Google a topic and that it's kind of hit or miss. But I'm thinking yeah, quite I, often, quite often, if I Google a, a topic and Twiv, it'll come up with the right episode. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think it sees the show notes and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that it does. But you know sometimes. Um, I'm I'm thinking of having a better index of sorts where it would be arranged by virus and would point to the episode. Thinking I'm, about that, yeah, I, we can we can talk later. I'm I'm probably pretty soon going to be trying out some um, transcript services we might be able to implement, but I'll let you know how that goes. There is a new feature on the podcast player Overcast, which I use. Now you can send a clip of a podcast to anyone. Hmm. Hmm. 
you know, like a one or two minute clip. It makes it very easy for you to, it will generate a URL for that specific part of the podcast. You can send it to someone or put it on a website. And when people click it, it will just play know. those two minutes. Isn't that cool? That's, That's nice. Cool. So I'm going to experiment with that. That might be useful for, you know, if you want to have clips for, from various episodes when, when Dixon says something funny, you know, ah, it's yeah. not very often. So it's not, no, it's more when you, when Alan has a clever title for the show, <laughs> which is every time <laughs> I have one before we move to our papers, one bit of news that deserves mention may first, the FDA approved then dang vaxia. The vaccine for dengue, tetravalent With vaccine. Quite a few restrictions. Oh boy! And they read. And they boy, listen. does this vaccine have some stories? I've blo- I've been doing briefs, brief uh, news stories on my blog on the turbid plaque, and um, uh, dengvaxia has come up recently because the Philippines just recently yes. pressed criminal charges yep. against. Yep. Uh, some researchers and Sanofi executives, uh, Sanofi Pasteur, developed Dengvaxia. Um, there's a whole lot of blame to spread around in the Philippines about this because they uh, rushed into approving Dengvaxia. Dengue sure. is a major problem there. Um, and disregarded warnings from experts in the field, virologists, who said, you know, you ought to be careful giving a Dengue vaccine to people who might never have been exposed to the virus. Because mm-hmm. you could actually make it worse. Correct. And they went ahead anyway and they started vaccinating millions of people, I think. They, they went on a widespread vaccination campaign and uh, several kids died mm-hmm. because they got vaccinated and then they subsequently got infected with dengue virus. And they got something we've talked about on the show repeatedly, um, which is the antibody mediated enhancement. Um, and they got a worse disease and, and, obviously very bad outcomes. And so now the Philippines then pulled the plug on Dengvaxia and all that. So the FDA has now approved Dengvaxia. Um, The caveats are you have to have had Dengue before (laughs) in order to receive it. And remember, the FDA is a U.S. agency. So there aren't a lot of places in the U.S. (laughs) where you will have had Dengue virus before. Puerto Rico is a Puerto Rico. Yes, Yes, Puerto Puerto Rico Rico comes to mind. um, but, and that's a place where you'd want to be immunized, but um, you're going to yeah. have to find or, or if you're traveling and you've, say, traveled somewhere and had dengue before, I know a number of right. people who fit that bill. You might want to take it. But this is um, – I, I spoke to a New York Times reporter this morning about this, and uh, she said, well, why would they do this and, and what's going to happen? Well, so I think that for travel and for Puerto Rico, you know, it could be useful but I worry that, like like in the Philippines, you know, because of this, measles immunization rates have dropped to thirty percent in the country because wow. now people are are unhappy about vaccines in general, and so that's going to be a problem. And I worry about FDA approving a vaccine with these, even though they have, you know, you have to have been infected. You can't be less than nine years old. There's also yeah, there's a there's an age restriction as well. I still I just worry that it's going to make things worse for vaccination in general. Did now, you listen to NPR yesterday? I don't, I don't listen I did. to NPR. I don't listen to NPR. NPR had uh, Scott Halstead on. Good. And he read on the riot act. He absolutely could not believe what had happened <laughs> because he's been screaming not to do this yeah. for years. Yeah. He's one of the people anyway. who warned the Philippines and the WHO when they rushed. I know. That's right. Yeah, we, That's we right. talked That's about, right. he had a commentary last year. We talked about it on Twitter. You're probably not on the episode. Dixon. You know, we should probably get him on the show. Can you get him on the show? I know him very well. He's a good friend of mine. All right. Well, then that's it. We're not going to be. Can you get him on the show anyway? (laughs) No. (laughs) That's a better way to put it. Yeah, I like that. No, no. Um, He's he's a... He's a yeah, good man. by the by the way, from a business perspective, what Sanofi gets out of this is, you know, you might say, well, why are they even going to produce a vaccine that'll have this tiny restricted market? They wanted a bigger market, um, but this is what they got, and because they have now developed a vaccine against a designated neglected tropical disease with such a small market, they receive a voucher from the FDA for expedited um, review of a subsequent product. Like a malaria vaccine. Like some, well, like some, it does, <laughs> probably something that's got a bigger market than this and a more profitable yeah, but market. Remember, this is also valid for military personnel. And that has uh, a real application. Who've been exposed. Yeah, but there's plenty of military personnel that have been exposed. Plenty of them. 
Well, you have to, you will have to do a diagnostic to make sure. All right. And so that, of course, so, of course, yeah. by the way, um, I, I, there was a session on this at the Rotterdam meeting wow. and uh, really good talk by one of the uh, authors on the vaccine who admitted that all the problems and uh, she said there are a number of others in the pipeline, pretty advanced in terms of clinical trials. There's an NIH vaccine, which we've talked about before, TV003, which is an attenuated vaccine. It's all dengue. It's not on a yellow fever backbone like Dengvaxia. And it's a single dose, which is really nice. Yeah. Then uh, Takeda has a attenuated candidate. Uh, GlaxoSmithKline has a purified and activated tetravalent vaccine. And Merck has a subunit vaccine all in the pipeline. So oh, wow. Dengvaxia is uh, not long, I think, for the world. And I think Sanofi won't be sad to see it go off the market. Yeah, but they, uh -huh. they put they put billi they put billions into it though. They did, but you know now they get this expedited review on something else, and they, um, you know, they maybe they sell a little vaccine on the way, and they learn some stuff, and hopefully they don't get uh, thrown in the slammer in the Philippines. Yeah. But you know, just to, and to and we should. I mean, I I don't want to pick on Sanofi. They're they're no, no we're not a good company. No. They do good stuff, and I think their hearts were in the right place here, and I think. Most of the people involved in the Philippines were trying to do the right thing in a country with a huge burden of disease, and they wanted to get this thing on the market, and everybody wanted it to work, and they just got a little ahead of the science. Now, they decided to use a yellow fever vaccine backbone, and it turns out in retrospect that that's not a good idea. You need other uh, dengue non-structural proteins in the vaccine, so we didn't know that. And in fact, we didn't realize these issues until we licensed it and went well beyond the third phase three timing. Yeah. Right. So that's, right. this is a, this is a good example of sometimes you don't find out, uh, some of the more subtle, uh, issues until the vaccine goes out to a larger population of individuals. Yeah. 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 And somebody, somebody had to be first, you know, there are all these other efforts going on. Um, Sanofi has been working on this for a long time and putting a lot of resources into it. And they were first to the, you know, first out of the gate. And the disadvantage of that is that they ended up first out with a product that discovered all the speed bumps. Speed bumps. I want to make a, another clarification here. And I think I've got this right. Correct me if I don't. But it may sound silly to some who are not in the know that you would approve a vaccine uh, for use only in people who have had the disease. Right. Because <laughs> that sounds like, uh, uh, you know, uh, how does it? Closing, closing the, barn the door. door. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So, but there are four serotypes of dengue. Uh, and the issue here is that the first round of infection with one serotype usually is not very serious disease, but because of what Alan mentioned, the antibody uh, induced enhancement that um, the infection with a second serotype can induce a, a really nasty disease. And so the logic here, it seems to me, is that if you've been uh, infected with uh, one strain, that taking the vaccine uh, may help you, uh, may help build resistance to the really uh, uh, terrible disease that you might get if you were infected with a second right yes so it, so it does have some it, it does have some value in this context you do want it, to close it, the barn door after the horses get out cuz you'll at least keep the cows from getting out right. so this is not it's not totally it's, it's not as silly as it sounds it does no, have some no value. it does make sense if i had had dengue virus and i would and was at risk of getting it again i would probably get this vaccine yeah if you were going to go back if i to, if i qualified actually what's the yeah. upper age cut off on that i don't <laughs> yeah, right. You might be too old. It's pretty restrictive. Yeah, I think it was 9 through 16. 9 through 16. I'm way past that. Forget oh, well. it. Forget it. Can't have it. You have to get yeah. the dengue hemorrhagic fever instead. Right. All right. Now, um, the, we have a snippet, which is actually two papers, but um, for a good reason, as you'll see. And again, I heard of these. I'd, I'd heard of these before, but at the meeting, someone talked about it, and I... You know, it's fresh in your mind, so I went back to my hotel and made up the TWIV show notes right away. And this is all about a wonderful virus, a really amazing, interesting virus, hepatitis D virus, or Delta, which I think we have talked about before on TWIV. So, 
but it is an interesting, it's the smallest known virus to infect mammals. It has a circular RNA genome of 1,700 nucleotides and causes one protein, well, actually two overlapping proteins called uh, delta antigens. And in humans, this uh, is found together with hepatitis B virus, which provides the protein so that it can be packaged. The viral genome is replicated in the host cell by RNA polymerase 2. It's an RNA genome. It's copied by RNA polymerase 2. And then it's packaged uh, in a particle that's made up of the delta antigens and proteins from hepatitis B virus. And so, and, and I met a guy uh, at the meeting and I said to him, people think that if you're infected with both delta and hepatitis B, by the way, 5% of the people in the world who have hep B have have delta. People feel that it makes disease worse. And then I said, but some people think that's not true. And he says, oh, it's definitely true. It definitely makes hep B worse if you have delta along with it. So for years, we've thought this only exists in humans. Never saw it in anywhere else. And now we have two papers where they find similar sequences in birds and snakes. Yep. And so I figured that could make for a good title, birds and snakes and delta. So let's let's go through these. The first uh, is um, in published in viruses, a divergent hepatitis D-like agent in birds. Uh, this is from uh, the Peter Doherty Institute in Melbourne, University of Sydney, and Deakin University in Geelong. <laughs> Geelong, that's that's how you say it, Geelong. Yep. Uh, Will Netter, Little John Yuan, Shi Eden, Class, and Eddie Holmes, and Aaron Hurt. And this is quite interesting because they were uh, looking through the transcriptome of healthy waterfowl that they captured at the Melbourne treatment water treatment plant <laughs> many years ago. They had oropharyngeal and cloacal samples from a couple of different waterfowl, and they were sequencing them just to to see what's in them. And they ended up finding a a sequence, a circular RNA sequence, which is clearly related to that of Hepatitis Delta virus. And the cool in thing ducks. in ducks. So these are ducks. And uh, the cool thing is that there's no hepatitis B virus. Ducks have duck hepatitis B virus. And they didn't see it. And this genome, you know, it's got distant. It's clearly not exactly like uh, hepatitis Delta from humans. The, the antigen is, is encoded in the genome. It has 32% amino acid similarity to the human, the hepatitis delta antigen, but it, it clearly can fold into a, most of the genome of het delta is base paired, like 70% base bearing, so yeah. it, it forms this cool rod, and this looks like it can do that too. Uh, and the it, paper, papers, uh, both of these papers we're going to talk about in the snippet are open access, and I the figure two, I had never seen that kind of a diagram before, and I saw yeah. it, I was like, wow, it's like Jupiter. But then, when you get past the trippy aspect, you yeah, get yeah. past the trippy aspect of it. It's it's this base pairing yeah. diagram that does a really nice job of showing how the thing folds into a rod. Another aspect of delta is that it has a ribozyme, a self cleaving sequence, which because mm -hmm. uh, the the genome replicates as concatenators and they get liberated by the ribozyme activity. So that seems to be there at least in sequence uh, as well. Uh, it seems to, now in delta, there's an interesting aspect where you, you have an open reading frame for delta antigen, and then there's a stop codon, and that can be post-transcriptionally edited to make it a codon, and then it, the protein can extend another 18 amino acids. So you get two different proteins that differ at the C-terminus, and the, the one that goes further is very important for packaging. It has an isoprenylation site, which is needed for the packaging. And this protein, uh, the open reading frame in this uh, bird delta-like agent, uh, it uh, it has a stop codon, but there's no, um, there, there, it looks like a frame shift will have to happen to get an extended protein, but it doesn't have an isoprenylation site, which maybe suggests that there's a different helper virus for this thing, if there is one. So in the case of the human, uh, just to be clear, in the case of the human hepatitis delta virus, the, it you know, the dogma is that it's dependent on hepatitis B virus for replication, but that mm. for, not really for replication, 
right? Because the packaging. am I correct for packaging? Because it gets it gets packaged using the hepatitis B virus surface protein. Right. So, but that's the only help that hepatitis B virus provides. So, right. so it's not necessarily a surprise that a, a Delta-like agent can replicate in the absence of a B-like agent. But the question then becomes, if there is no hepatitis B-like agent around, how is it transmitted? And, and in this paper, in the subsequent paper, nobody has described any particles. Mm -hmm. So we don't know how these, how either of these viruses we're going to talk about might get packaged or transmitted. But the, in both cases, the hypothesis is, well, maybe they're using some other virus. I mean, I thought that maybe they're not. So it depends on how strong you think the data are on transmission. And when we talk about the snakes, there's a little more. But yeah, the guy I talked to um, at the meeting, Steve Urban is his name. He said, you know, these these Delta agents could just replicate in cells and then spread to new cells when they divide. And so, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like many uh, viruses of, say, yeast, where they don't have extracellular phases. Right. And so they or uh, making them a plasmid. Yeah. You had that yeah. discussion. Yeah. So uh, I don't know, but I think the snake data is a little more consistent with transmission, mm -hmm. as we'll see. Mm -hmm. But it, there's I, no in, there's no indication in this case that there's any pathology associated with this, correct? Yeah, these at were least healthy. in the birds. Yeah, the birds were healthy, apparently. Although, you know, who knows about a bird, right? Just like mice, who knows? <laughs> who knows what they're feeling? <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny when you say the animals looked healthy, right? <laughs> Things can be going on in there. Well, but you can, I mean, animals can look sick. Yes, but they could also have pathology, but not look overtly sick, yes. you know. And I don't think they even looked in the tissues of these ducks because they were just doing swabs, right? And probably releasing them and so forth. So the, the fact that these ducks were acquired at a water treatment plant suggests right. to me, at least, that they could have acquired them through just drinking the water. Maybe. Yeah, but they're clearly not, he they're not hepatitis delta virus. They're not, yeah, they're not hepatitis delta. They're not, this is not, as far as we can tell, a human virus. It's not, it's divergent. And both this and the snake viruses are clearly delta-like, but they they have some common ancestor probably, right? How yeah. different are they from human? Yeah, there's, figure, figure one, there's a, um, uh, there's a, there's a tree of these, <clears throat> And it's all the human delta antigen strains and clustered into their uh, branchings. And then at the very, very base, there's this totally separate branch coming off to the side that comes up along. Yeah. And then you've got the avian and the boa constrictor one that we're, we're going to talk about in the, a moment. The protein, the delta antigen, is only 32% similar to the human right. protein. Right. Okay. I don't know what the, but yeah, the, the phylogenetic tree is striking. It's just. Yeah, they a, look like an outgroup. <laughs> an outgroup. The, sure. the, the, the hepatitis delta, there are quite a few uh, uh, different, I, I don't forgot what they call them, um, sequences that are circulating right. in people. And they all cluster, now, as Alan said. Um, this looks like an outgroup because this is the order in which we discovered these. But uh, as we'll probably talk about after we talk about the snake paper, you know, we found if you find this in another place, chances are you're going to now look for more. And it may be that the human delta antigen is the, um, the minor Parrot? out group. This, oh, yeah, this, this may be uh, the, no, this, this may be something that is, that is widespread in the animal kingdom. We don't know. Yeah. I think just if you don't, if you don't look for it, um, yeah, that's right. And the, the right. tools to look for this haven't been available. I mean, we're talking about this next generation sequencing project that they did here, and it's a very similar technique in the other paper. So you can now swab the butts of a bunch of ducks and then just sequence everything in there and find stuff like this. And so that mm -hmm. technology has enabled this. Well, also remember that there are plenty of sequences already in databases. So I that bet too. now people will go mine it and find yes. more. I'm sure there are more out there. Um, but this is just an example of how you think this is the only virus uh, out there in humans, and then you just have to look at this metagenomic data. We think we're so special. We're not. We're not. <laughs> and every time you say it doesn't happen or this doesn't occur, you probably yeah, you shouldn't. That. You probably shouldn't anymore. You should learn not to say that. <laughs> Everything gets overturned eventually. I'm, re I'm reading a book, which is uh, going to be my pick, and you know they're they were looking for something, and— um, they're looking. They're looking for DNA in ancient specimens, and 
by PCR. They couldn't find it. And then as soon as next generation sequencing came along, boom, <laughs> you can get it. It's remarkable, remarkable. So that's the bird uh, avian or the bird uh, HDV like agent. And they call it uh, H- avian HDV like agent, which I think is appropriate. <laughs> because, you know, the, the, calling it hepatitis delta virus. The word hepatitis, we don't know if this causes hepatitis in birds. So yeah, good I, point. I suspect right. this is going to have to change at some point. Here, here. Uh, the second paper is in MBIO. This is uh, identification, also open access, of uh, identification of a novel Delta virus in boa constrictors. And the, uh, the name Delta virus is great. It makes me think of New Orleans. Yes. <laughs> really? Down in the Delta. Yeah, Delta. Not University of Zurich, University of Helsinki. Uh, Hetzel Zero Visha Smura Prahauser Valpalati Kipar and Hepo Yoki. I'm sorry, my Finnish friends, and, and <laughs> that I ma- massacred all those names, but um, at least I pronounced them. So here, this is interesting. They had a couple of sick snakes. So someone had a colony of snakes, and they were. They were acting funny, and they were suspected to have Boyd inclusion body disease. And the owner said, uh, please uh, euthanize them and um, take a look and see what's going on. So they had uh, is a boa constrictor sabogi, and it was a breeding pair and two offspring, and also a water python from the same colony, so it's a different species, right? Lyasis macalodi salvensis, salvensis. And, and um, these had an interesting history. They had been uh, imported from Panama to Italy, and then they were sold to a private owner in Switzerland. These snakes right. have been now around. They, uh, was that all of them? I know the, the breeding pair had produced the offspring, but um, was the water python also from Panama originally? I don't know about that. I don't know. They don't really say. The parental animals were from Panama, but I don't know about the others. They don't really say. And Bowett in, Bowett inclusion body disease is um, characterized by inclusion bodies that are that is if you look in a microscope you'll see in cells spots of something that shouldn't be there mm-hmm. um, somewhere I don't know exactly the details of this one but depending on the disease it can be in different places and they're usually diagnostic of like assembly sites for viruses and that kind of stuff and in the Boa inclusion body disease you find inclusion bodies in a number of dish- different tissues including neurons and it's clear that the disease is transmissible uh, because uh, snakes housed near other snakes uh, can get the disease, but they don't know what causes it. Mm. And because it infects neurons, one of the uh, symptoms that you get is, one of the prime symptoms you get is neurological. Now, how do you tell when a snake has a neurological disease? They oh. throw up. <laughs> they throw up? Yes. Are you, are you they, serious? They, I'm serious. Oh, one wow. of the major signs is regurgitation. They throw up and they also act funny. Uh, I think so they, they, they eat something you know, and they throw it up, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they act funny also. That's the that's the uh, hint I got here as well. All right, so they euthanized these snakes. They made uh, they extracted RNA from brain, liver, and blood. Did the next generation sequencing, and as they're looking over, lo and behold, they find uh, <laughs> circular RNA corresponding to uh, hepatitis delta virus related sequences. They call it snake HDV, but again, I don't think that that's probably the final name for this. And they find them in the brain, the blood, and the liver from uh, both animals. And uh, this looks like hepatitis delta. They have a lovely phylogenetic th- tree now where we have uh, all the human hep delta sequences. And then you have the snake and the avian. So they already knew about the other paper when they were doing there's, this. Theirs is drawn in the new radial format. The other one was drawn yeah. in the <clears throat> more traditional tree format. But this one is, again, very dramatic. There's this this cluster, you know, in a nice, almost neat circle at the top, and then this ray shooting off to the side with snake and avian. Right. And since in this case they have a lot more uh, tissues because they guess they did a complete uh, necropsy on all of these animals, that's a much more complete set of data because they're dealing with much more than just swabs and stuff. Mm -hmm. So this Delta, the Delta engine encoded in this, 55%. Identity to 
human and 37% to avian delta. So it's uh, a little more similar. This the, the open reading frame terminates with a stop codon and editing they, they predict would add on some more residue. So maybe you get the two proteins. It makes a rod-like structure, has ribozymes. Uh, and then they say, well, let's look in tissues again. So they designed an RT-PCR assay, and they look in uh, liver samples from the parents, and the two parental boas, and four of the seven offspring and the water python. Okay, so now doing PCR uh, in liver tissues. Uh, and um, they found it in um, all of them, I think, right? Yeah, so the so, python and the two parents and the offspring yep. are all infected. Then they looked at snakes from a different breeder, right? Completely different place. 20 blood samples, and three of them are positive mm-hmm. by PCR. So I, I think the best um, evidence that of transmission is that the water python is positive, and it's in the yeah. same colony as these mm-hmm. boas, right? Because you could always say that it's vertically transmitted among the boas, but that would not happen for the water python. Um, that, by the way, means from parent to offspring. So as far as I know, boas don't give birth to water pythons, right? <laughs> don't think so. And from what I, from what I can tell, this is... <laughs> In Dolly Partonville, they do. This is not the cause of the boa inclusion body disease. Right, right. You right. find it in healthy animals. The boa inclusion body disease is probably something else. Yeah. This is just what they found while they were trying to uh, look at the snakes that were sick. Right. But they were probably sick for some other reason. Mm-hmm. Boa inclusion body disease and not this. Yeah. And in this case, there's, uh, although I wouldn't rule out the notion that there is a hepatitis B virus of snakes somewhere, there has not been one described. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the case of the birds, there is a duck hepatitis virus right. that could at some point, uh, I suppose, be um, the helper for the uh, uh, Delta virus in, in the ducks, though that doesn't have to be the case. In the case of the snakes, no one has described a, a beta-like virus, but you can bet your life they're mm-hmm. working. But in both cases, the bird and the snake, they didn't see any sequences right. like a hepatitis-like virus. So right. I would bet it's another virus, if anything. I I I agree with you, and I and I would actually I'm uh, I'm interested in the idea that perhaps this can be carried uh, without a helper. Though, yeah, as yeah. you point out, in, in this particular case, it does seem to there does seem there's evidence for horizontal transmission. Yeah, right. So Steve Urban thought that it could very well be that. Delta-like agents are just maintained without making particles. So we'll see. We'll see. I'll look forward to the papers. And both modes could be happening. There could, could be. be just yeah. a, you know maintained without making particles until a helper virus comes along and helps it spread to the next host, and then it's maintained there. Right. Now, in this paper, they made antibodies against the, the uh, Delta antigen. And they can do Western blots of snake tissue extracts and they can see um, in some tissues the large and the small delta antigen, although in the brain they only see the large one. I don't know what that means at all, but they can see the proteins. So, in other words, this genome is there, and it's being yeah, there, so. It's the viral genome is negative stranded, so it's being transcribed to mRNA, and that's being translated into proteins. They could also use those antibodies to look at tissue sections by immunohistochemistry and see where uh, the proteins are. And they look at brain, liver, lung, kidney, and spleen. And they can see uh, the proteins in various cells. They can see them in neurons. They can see them in hepatocytes, in uh, epithelial cells in the lung, what look like macrophages in the spleen. And it seems to be both cytoplasmic and nuclear. So in many tissues, and they say this is consistent with replication in many tissues, which I think is probably okay. Yeah. So it seems to be replicating. It seems to be in different snakes suggesting transmission. And again, um, what's the helper? So they don't know, but they say, we'll look. So those, those I thought those are two cool uh, papers. Just yeah. Really mm-hmm. intriguing. 
And uh, so I wonder, maybe many years ago, there was an ancestor of Delta, which just was a replicon, a plasmid, as Kathy says, an RNA plasmid that was replicating in cells and spreading as divide. And maybe one day that cell became infected with another virus and it all worked it out well. Match. <laughs> it made its yeah. match, made particles. And, and so... Beginning of a beautiful partnership. That's right. Uh, I've always been fascinated with Delta. And uh, this is pretty cool stuff. Nobody actually... Does anybody actually know how the Delta antigens, the proteins that are encoded by this thing, aid in replication and packaging? Right. So there are two different issues, right? One, the small one helps, is needed for replication. Right. I don't think it's known. Okay. The large one, uh, I believe... All right, so the small, I think the small one makes up the nucleoprotein or the nucleocapsid around the genome. It's a negative strand that RNA is coated with protein. I think it's coated with small antigen. So you could look at it as kind of a nucleocapsid of a negative strand RNA virus, and mm -hmm. those are involved in RNA synthesis in some way. So presumably the small T is doing that. The large T bridges the nucleocapsid with uh, the, the viral glycoproteins that are sticking through the membrane. Okay. Uh, the viral glycoproteins, they have B viral glycoproteins. And so in, in pictures that I've seen, they, they're they inside the particle and they're kind of attaching the nuclear cap. So you could almost look at them as an encapsidation protein. So that's my understanding of it. Not a lot of people work on these uh, viruses, but um, there's still a little bit. And the, the Steve Urban, who provided me some insight at the meeting in Rotterdam, told me something very interesting he said, "If you treat, if for first of all, you can treat. Pay, they have an entry inhibitor for Hep B and Delta because they share a receptor. It's the Toro choline receptor transporter. Remember that uh, from another TWIV. Let me find out the same, so. the exact name. Um, yes, yeah, sodium Toro cholate cotransporter is the receptor for both Hep B and Delta because they have the same." like a protein on the surface. And they have a, they've made an entry inhibitor, actually, which they're uh, using in clinical trials uh, to uh, knock down infection. And he said, actually, you can inhibit delta with interferon. It only works when the cells divide. And, you know, delta replicates in the nucleus. It's where the transcription occurs. And he thinks the nuclear membrane breaks down, and then uh, nucleases uh, induced by interferon may move into the nucleus and chew up the Delta genome. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so I'm uh, flipping out here for a second. If the uh, small Delta antigen binds the RNA, right. uh, as would a nucleocapsid, the large Delta antigen, which is just an extension of that, it seems it should, I would say, would bind the RNA as well. Right. And the, ex the prenylation on the extension Prenylation is the addition of a hydrophobic molecule that could insert itself into membranes, and so yeah, that would account exactly. for the packaging function. Right. That's right. That's so, right. All cool. That's exactly right. I have a nice picture in the textbook, but I didn't bring it up here. Yes, I don't think that it's interacting with the viral glycoprotein. It's interacting with the membrane via the isoprenylation sequence, right? And so the lack of the isoprenylation sequence on the bird HDV-like agent um, well, that tells us that there's got to be another way for it to mm -hmm. interact. So, yeah. all right, that's if in fact cool. it's packaged. Yeah, if yeah. in fact, we'll, yeah, very interesting stuff. Really cool. This could, if these things are replicating and and surviving independent of a helper virus, they could be the smallest viruses, right? Well, they are in mammals anyway. I mean, I'm, no, I mean the smallest independent functioning viruses <laughs> well um, uh, that, that would be a lot that would be a tall order though well they yeah but they couldn't spread from cell to cell by the particle route right unless they can unless they can package themselves somehow yeah i mean they're how big are how big are they 1700 nucleotides I mean, yeah, they're viruses as, as far as i'm teeny. concerned they're just they need a helper virus to, to yeah. make a particle but they do pretty well in a cell a lot of people are infected with this. Quite interesting. Uh, has uh, uh, has anybody ever done a study to look whether there might exist he hepatitis delta virus in people who do not have hepatitis B? 
I mean, I know the dogma mm -hmm. is that it serves as a helper, but with next generation sequencing, I wonder if anybody's mm -hmm. had a close enough look. Yeah, that's a good question. I did ask him that, and he said, no, you only see it in people with Hep B, but I can't imagine that they've But is that because that's only, <laughs> yeah, have you looked anywhere else? How much have you looked, right? I mean, you would, I guess you'd have to have blood because it's going to be viremic. Yeah. Um, but that's another interesting question. There are blood genomic libraries out there that you could search for it. And, and it may it. be, yeah, there, there's, there are epidemiological reasons why that could be hard to tease apart, too, because those would tend to travel together since they're blood-borne diseases. If, if Hep Delta could survive on its own, it may just always travel with hepatitis B anyway. Mm. Well, but worth looking. All good questions. The dangers posed by chemical and biological threats are constantly evolving, requiring innovative solutions. Could your research help provide the next generation of protection from weapons of mass destruction or a potential pandemic? Submit your abstract and answer the call for papers at the 2019 Chem Biodefense Science and Technology Conference. Submission opens May 7th for both poster and oral presentations across a variety of topics. The conference is hosted by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency and provides the opportunity to collaborate with more than 1,500 of the most influential scientists, program managers, and leaders in the chem biodefense community. For more information and a complete list of topics, visit cbdstconference.com. Submit your abstract by Friday, June 21st, and help shape the future of chemical and biological defense. That's cbdstconference.com. Submit your abstract today. Right now, stop the recorder, go submit it. <laughs> go submit your abstract. Well, you have to wait till the May 7th. Well, May 7th, but start start writing up your abstract. Actually, yeah. this episode drops on the uh, 5th, so you've got a couple of days to you write do. it. You do. DITRA, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, thank you for your support. Yes. All right, now we have a paper which um, I also saw saw in uh, Rotterdam, but I, frankly, this has been in my folder of potential TWIV papers for quite a while. But hearing it talked about uh, kind of moved me forward, and hopefully I can tell you why. This was published in 2018. It is fatal swine acute diarrhea syndrome caused by an HKU2 related coronavirus of bat origin. And this three co first authors. Yeah. Peng Zhao, Hong Fan, and Chan Lan. And the other and then and there a are, bazillion whew, other authors. A lot of other authors. And on there, people I recognize are Peter yeah, Dashak. That's right. And Lin Fa Wang. Peter, of course, here in New York City at the Eco Health Alliance. And Lin Fa is uh, the Batman. Yes. Works on bat viruses, and I met him and interviewed him a couple of years ago. And he'll be at ASV this year. Oh, cool. Is he um, at a main thing, a symposium or a plenary? What is he doing? Do you know? Yeah, he's a symposium speaker. Nice. He's a good guy. Very nice I guy. count 45 authors. <laughs> and the, the senior author is Jing Yun Ma, who Jing was Yun presumably Ma. responsible for wrangling the other 44 authors. And I wonder if he stuff. plays the cello. Mm. No, that's Yo-Yo. I, I wonder if he only speaks at night. Um, tell us why why you say that. Because he's a bat expert and he only works at night. Ah, so. oh, Dixon, it's pretty obscure. Oh, not for bat people, it's not. <laughs> okay, so pigs, uh, China, they grow a lot of pigs. And right now they're worried about African swine fever virus uh, because that infects yeah. pigs and yeah. have a lot of but issues. They are having a big uh, outbreak. Last I heard, it was not going well in terms of controlling it so i don't know what the status yeah, is now that's a huge problem and that's well, i mean that that is a staple food in china it's a major major source of protein so just the fact of losing all that is a big deal yeah i think we need to start switching to other sources of proteins ideally yes i kind of like tofu in the meantime, <laughs> you know, back in 2016, you got got a lot of people eating pigs. I understand that. Back in 2016, there was an outbreak of a fatal s disease in swine in uh, Guangdong province that includes Hong Kong. And that's uh, uh, the province where SARS emerged uh, a while ago. It's about 100 kilometers away. 
So this was a um, a, a diarrheal disease, mainly causing uh, issues in piglets. So, uh, Por- porcine epidemic diarrhea virus was the initial. Yeah, they thought that was it. That's a coronavirus, and they right. said and they actually got that out of the, some of the initial pigs. Uh, but then, um, and that had been on the farm before, so that's known to be a problem. But uh, after January 2017, the, the epidemic was con- continuing. They no longer found that virus. They say we could no longer detect it in deceased piglets. And all of you piglet fans will feel very sad. It's not the piglet of, you know, Winnie, Winnie the Pooh. The Pooh. No, no, it's deceased no. piglets. So they started so these looking. These piglets did have quite a lot of poo. <laughs> That's very good. That's a good title. Piglets had a lot of poo. So then uh, they want. So this is a severe and acute diarrhea, acute vomiting, uh, which would lead to death because of rapid weight loss in newborn piglets less than five year, days of age. Um, two, they would die two to six days after disease onset. The sows uh, had mild diarrhea, which I think in a pig is probably um, uh, normal. A lot. <laughs> it's normal. It's normal. Pigs always have diarrhea. They no. have stools. There's no question about it. I don't know. I have, would I, have I thought, no idea. Oh, they I do. It was usually fairly thick. There's anyway, a, the, the there's a slang phrase about that. In fact, it's it's thick, but it's a, it's One collected in lagoons. As, remember, it's not collected by a tractor. Well, right. Plow. I mean, it's yeah. They, it, it floats downhill and it goes. It's more liquid than solid. The sows recover, so they don't die. But it's the piglets, and of course, you need the piglets to grow up and become protein. Yeah. So, um, no fever. Ninety percent mortality in piglets. Yeah. That's that's a lot. And then eight days older, older than eight days, it drops to 5%. It's remarkable, right? Uh, and then they found uh, in in uh, other farms, three additional farms between 20 and 150 kilometers of this first farm, they also had outbreaks that caused the death of over 24,000 piglets. Amazing. 64% of all piglets born in February were, were had died. It's a lot. Wow. And it has since abated, and and they say we took measures to control, the, which that what they call uh, SADS, Swine Acute Diarrhea Syndrome. SADS. And as you will see, it turns out to be a coronavirus, and so now it's called SADS coronavirus as opposed to SARS coronavirus. Right, very close. It's funny. I just heard a wonderful talk about Borna disease virus. And that Martin Beer was the guest on one of the twivs. You'll hear it. And they, they, it makes horses sad. They get a neurological illness where they call them sad horse syndrome. Hmm. All so right. that explains the long face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, we took measures to control of sads, including separation of sick sows and piglets from the rest of the herd. I wonder how it got there in the first place. Well, we'll talk about that later. It's very interesting. Okay, so they took some uh, sample from... A diseased piglet, small intestine, and they did next generation sequencing. And uh, out of 15 million reads, sequence reads, they got 4,000 matching a bat coronavirus called HKU2 that had been detected uh, previously in Chinese horseshoe bats in Hong Kong and Guangdong province. Yep. A bat coronavirus. They got the whole genome. Uh, and uh, these were all on the on the uh, farms. They were all very ninety nine point nine percent similar. So it looks like, well, they're they're very similar. Let's put it that way. So it looks like um, it might be a corona. So they did piece. They developed a PCR assay, very much like uh, what we talked about with the snakes and hepatitis delta. They go back into the piglets and and say, can we find the the, the genome in there? And they could, in fact. By RT-PCR find this coronavirus in sick piglets and sows, but not in healthy pigs on the four farms, not in recovered pigs, not in nearby farms that hadn't shown any evidence of SADS. And this seems to be tropic for the small intestine. It's replicating there and causing diarrhea. No. And um, so this is the virus that was on all four farms. Even during the... Uh, porcine epidemic, diarrhea virus epidemic, this virus was also present. And they speculate whether that had that PEDV had anything to do with susceptibility to uh, this SADS coronavirus. We don't really know. They kind of lean toward there's just a coincidence. 
because this yeah. persisted long after the, um, the yeah. BEDV was detectable. So it doesn't seem to need that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Keep it going. I don't know what, what exactly the other virus would have done anyway. So they made some antibodies against uh, the, the viral glycoprotein. And they uh, looked at some tissues. And they also looked at serum from farm workers who had contact with the pigs, which is really good. because good idea. You might worry that... Uh, this virus, like uh, Nipah, you know, could go from pigs to humans. But apparently, these um, these farm workers were negative, seronegative for antibodies against the virus. So that's good because uh, that is a possibility that this could jump from pigs to people and then cause a problem. Overall genome identity. Oh, okay. So now let's talk a little bit about this virus. Um, so the member they said it was similar to this HKU coronavirus. Uh, overall identity ninety five percent of the genome, but the spike is only eighty six percent identical. And so they say maybe the HKU two is not the progenitor of SADS coronavirus. So the spike is so this is a uh, what a positive strand. Yes, it is a positive RNA virus, big guy, uh, membraned, and the spike is a a uh, big old glycoprotein that sticks out of the membrane. So it's it's uh, going to be uh, uh, prominent to the immune system and important for uptake of the virus. Right. And if if the HKU2 were the virus that jumped into pigs, you would you would expect the spike to be more similar mm-hmm. than, than that because that's going to be able to bind to a receptor in pigs and so forth. Uh, so they did some, uh, they looked in some uh, other bats. They did some PCR on ni- 591 bat anal swabs collected between 2013 and 2016 from seven different locations in Guangdong. And there's a nice map in the um, supplementary data. I had a student here this morning from, from uh, Hong Kong. And I showed her this map, and she said, "I have no, I have no idea where that is." <laughs> so you live in Hong Kong, you don't, <laughs> you don't know anything about the rest true. of the country. It's true. It's funny, like me, I, I don't know anything outside of New York. Right? I've been to Guangzhou. You have? Yeah. I didn't know you went to China. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, we uh, we adopted our daughter from China. Oh, oh. right. Yeah, I remember so, that now. Yeah, okay. got. Um, Did you she, get SARS? She's from Fujian Province. No, we didn't really pick anything up while we were there. Very good, as far as I know. Um. So we, we got her in Fuzhou, which is the capital of Fujian province, and then flew to um, Guangzhou, which is where the U.S. consulate is that processes the U.S. side yeah. of the adoptions there. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I spent about a week in Guangzhou. Um, we went to the, the street market there where they had all sorts of uh, interesting, you know, you could buy live scorpions to fry up for dinner. And Did you, have a, did you see an open meat market? Uh, we did not visit an open meat market. No, I'm sure there's, I'm sure they're there. I know they're there. But, yeah, uh, yeah. We did not. We did not take our fourteen um, month old child with us through. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. All right. So this is PCR looking for SADS coronavirus, the the pig virus isolate. Right. They want to say, is there anything very similar to this in bats? Because the PCR would be uh, pretty specific for that. Right. And fifty eight of those five hundred and ninety one swab. It's about ten percent were positive for. Uh, the SADS coronavirus genome. This is from rhinolophus bats, which are sure. also the horseshoe bats. Yeah, these are also the hosts of SARS coronaviruses. That, to me, 10% is a pretty big number. It is. Yeah. Bats are full of these uh, coronaviruses as yeah, well as you, others, you too. You just go out and, and grab a bat and have a one in 10 chance of finding <laughs> this very virus. That's kind of scary. Mm. Just grab a bat and uh, what do they call it when you when you hit... Balls way up in the air. There's a name for that. I can't remember. Pop-up. Pop-up. Uh, no, there's a better name for it, though. When you hit the bat balls out so that the outfielders can practice catching them. Shag flies. Fungos. Fungos, right? Fungos. Good. When I was in high school, I, I um, tried out for the baseball team, and oh. these fungos scared me because they were so high, <laughs> I, could, I could never catch any of them. I was afraid they would hit my head. Yeah, so at good. the last That's minute, sure. I would I would shy away, and that was the end of my baseball career. Well, you could have played for the Mets. <laughs> <laughs> so they end up cloning four complete genomes out of these bats there. SADS-related coronaviruses. So now it's SADS-related, right? Because it's not actually SADS. And now 
the overall identity is 96 to 98 percent, but the spike glycoprotein gene is now 98 percent compared to 86 for the HKU. So probably, you know, these are more closely related to the one that caused the outbreak. So that's the point here that there's something very closely related coronavirus circulating in bats that are pretty near the um, the farms that were affected. I figure about 100 miles. So can a bat fly 100 miles? Oh, yeah. No problem? Eventually. None. They migrate thousands of miles sometimes. Oh, okay. So this is... This is an easy deal for a bat. Well, also, um, you know, there are probably bats closer to these farms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. These just happen to be the ones that they, they sampled, sampled that were yeah, yeah. miles away. Yes. That's right. That's right. Mm. Now, I mean, there could be there could be bats roosting in the rafters of the of the uh, barn. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sure. So, are these pigs outdoors or indoors? Outdoors, because here in, uh, in the U.S., they're often indoors, right? Yeah, it's but in gonna, China, they're all outdoors. Really? Okay. It, it might be a mix, but I'm gonna guess probably outdoors. That's the. Um, I mean, the cities in China end really abruptly, and then it's just. Rural, rural, mm-hmm. like people Remember, plowing fields with oxen. Rural, and um, so I'm, I'm guessing it's probably outdoors. But they're also a rapidly urbanizing nation, so you've got um, some of the factory farming techniques. Uh, so it, it, I would assume it's a mix. Mm. Remember, pigs and ducks. They're raised in the same area, so yeah. The traditional Chinese agriculture would have uh, that's right. Pigs and ducks in close proximity. Exactly. All right. So that explains how a bat could infect the piglets obviously because in the u.s and in canada the pigs are inside and you can't even go in there you know all it has to do is infect the mother pig not the piglets right because the mother then well and that's not to say you couldn't get bats roosting in a u.s or canadian um pig barn i suppose of course a human could also bring it inside you know yeah so what do these bats eat are these insectivorous bats are these uh fruit eating bats um let's let's look up Rhinolophus. Because oh. N- Nipah is a mango farm pig kind of nexus, as I recall. Date palm? Date palms. That's what they eat? Date palms? Uh, well, they are in date palm trees, so dates. <laughs> dates. Hmm. Is that a southern China product? I'm talking about Nipa. Sorry. Oh, no, no, Those no. Bats. Didn't we also discuss mango with that? Yeah, yeah, they like to. All, all species of rhinolophids are insectivorous. Okay, yes, insectivorous, right? Okay, apparently I, that's a Wikipedia <laughs> thing, but I, it seems credible. Yeah, right. Why uh, did you ask, Dixon? Well, just trying to work out the ecology of how the bat arrives at the pig farm. Why would it go to a pig farm when it could go, you know, hunting its food, basically? So, if the insects that it's consuming is associated, let's say, with um, the, the the duck ponds, for instance, where you've got a lot of aquatic insects hatching constantly, for instance, you might find a lot of bats there because that's where their food is. Well, maybe there are insects on the pig bat on the pigs, right? And they're going down and eating them off. Is that <sighs> unlikely? I'm I'm talking out of my uh, ears here, but kind of. I think it, it might be a yeah. bit of a stretch on that one. Yeah, I, I think. think Alan? I, yeah, I think bat guano is the more likely. Yeah, way you transmit this. So they're flying over and they're pooping. And yeah, they're flying around. Like they're that. pooping on the pigs, and the pigs are indiscriminate about what they're eating off the ground. And you know, and this is an enteric virus, so that'd be the way to get it. Right, yeah. it gets in the slop. Okay, um, so they do some um, phylogenetic analysis, and they say that the viruses from the four farms probably originated from independent spillovers from hmm. bat, most likely bat reservoirs. Well, then they qualify it. You right. Know, I, they they're, do. they're unclear on this. Okay. Yeah. They, they say that it, yeah, it might have been independent. And then they say mm-hmm. uh, molecular clock analysis of the genome sequences failed to establish a positive association between right. sequence diversion and sampling date. They speculate that either the virus was introduced into pigs from bats multiple times or the virus was introduced into pigs once but subsequent genetic uh, recombination disturbed the molecular clock. You know, I don't know. It's funny that either one that it originated independently, but maybe not. It's weird, but yeah, my, my first reaction to that is, "Eh, I'm not so sure. But you know, here, here's the thing that if you look at the epi curve, which is kind of neat figure one, 
you kind of see it's on one, two farms first, and then yeah. then on the second two farms, it's later, and then there's another outbreak on the first yeah. farm. So, and then so, did it like, uh, it, I'm unclear as to whether it burned out or they did separate the infected sows that they could identify, right? But, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah they did. Uh, it, it, um, the, yeah, the it grass, did seem to kind of burn out. Especially on the second two farms, the graph just ends and the epidemic, the outbreak is still going on. Yeah, yeah. And so I think in the interest of publishing the paper, they had to stop at some point. But they, mm-hmm. they say they've implemented quarantine procedures and that seems to have controlled the outbreak. Um, so, mm. you know, I guess, I guess we'll, well see. With SARS, there might have been a seasonality to the outbreak, which may also, uh, they say there's striking mm-hmm. similarities between the SADs and the SARS. The last sentence of the abstract, which is the, the only one I can access from my home, unfortunately, because nature has a paywall for this. It says, this study highlights the importance of identifying coronavirus diversity and distribution in bats to mitigate future outbreaks that could threaten livestock, public health, and economic growth. That means that you have to find a reason for those bats being near those pigs. You know, that's funny. Otherwise, that, how are you going to mitigate? It's funny that they say that because the guy who who presented the talk on this, who, who, who uh, kind of... He talked about the Delta and this story, and that's where I thought it would be cool to do both. He, someone asked him, do you think we should be uh, sequencing all the viruses in bats? He says, no, absolutely not. There's, you have no idea which ones are going to spill over yeah. into pig. He said there's different, there are better ways to do that, which and I don't remember what he said. I, I, would, I don't know. They don't identify what's still necessary to know before they can mitigate these outbreaks. That's what I Well, like yes. To. I mean, I think you should put your pigs indoors. That would help a lot, right? Don't pick. Don't put all your pigs in one basket. That's maybe that's true. But you know the the idea that I, I like the idea that there's a separate spillover on each farm. But let's say the alternative would be it goes from farm to farm. How would that mm. happen? Do, do the farmers travel to each other's places and maybe their boots are contaminated or something? I don't think so. I think it's. I think the farm to farm spread is probably bat born as well. I, I would agree because I mean you've got another disease. So, a hog cholera, or, or which does spread that way. Or it's trading of breeding stock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, like animals are auctioned and traded, and that, uh, I mean, that's something that's normally done in agriculture, and you can't stop that. So it, it could be transfer of animals. Um, I'd be interested to know it. if there's any communication between these farms in it, of any yeah. sort, right? Because in, in the U.S., at least, I know that you can spread these viral outbreaks by farmers driving from one farm to another for whatever reason and their truck tires are contaminated and so forth. Right. That that can happen. It also sounds like if a pig is more than five days old, they've received colostrum from their immune mothers and therefore they don't get very sick from this virus. Whereas if they're born from Mm -hmm. a mother that's Mm -hmm. harboring the virus, they're going to die. So that may be the mitigation strategy that they're thinking about. How long does a, a piglet, uh, drink milk from its mother it sounds like five days <laughs> no, i think it's longer than no. that but in the first five days they get all the protection they need for this so if you could find a surrogate mother that was um hku2 negative to feed these little piglets on five days before they go out in the field you're you're set mm. you've only got a five percent mortality rate after that so bad we don't have stephanie uh here she could tell us all about yeah, she, she did her phd me. on on pigs and um antibodies ah. and, and milk and so i guess these are uh milk transmitted iga which are the ones yeah. that you need to protect yeah. against this intestinal infection it sounds the, like uh, the 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 range of a problem here is to me is really striking mortality rate as high as 90 percent in piglets that are five days or younger mm-hmm. right okay but if you're older than eight days eight days the mortality fine. drops to five percent okay so, so it's you know, really, hand, really narrow. Yeah. Collecting immune um, colostrum and then hand feeding these pigs for the first eight days would be the solution. I think you would probably do that if there were an outbreak. You don't want to do it all the time, right? Right. Yeah, but if you're in an endemic center and it doesn't go away. And I, I, 
I still feel that there's a periodicity to this that has something to do with cycles in nature, not maybe ni- migrating bats, but maybe the emergence of, let's say, grasshoppers or some other mm. insect food that the bats depend upon. So yeah, yeah, could it be. doesn't bring them to the farms all the time. So, I, you know, you, need, you really need a thorough ecological explanation for what's going on here. In, I, I, this yeah, is, insects would this make is sense, yeah. Intriguing. Relative. Relative to my other question, they say the outbreak has abated Mm -hmm. and measures that were taken to control SADS included separation of sick cows and piglets from the rest of the herd. That they don't say that those measures caused the outbreak (laughs) to abate. I my I my sense is that this thing somehow uh to to a large extent burned out. Burned itself. Yeah, like I'm trying to understand why. That's right. Well, if you remember Stanley Perlman when we were in Iowa. We asked him, and he said, "Well, it's not a very uh, transmissible virus, and uh, the the uh, procedures that were implemented, preventing travel and so forth, they worked to pre- mm-hmm. to interrupt transmission. So again, here maybe this is not very infectious, and th- their their procedures were enough to stop it. Mm-hmm. It's also possible. I don't know how the pig raising process goes, um, especially in China." Uh, but there could be some seasonality or at least some periodicity to that. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that if you have if you have your pigs, you know, raised in in litters and you have a litter of them and ninety percent of them die, mm-hmm. right? Well, you know that the virus in that ninety percent is gone, and the ones that are older than that are fine. And now you're raising those pigs for a few weeks, and you don't have any in this any susceptibles in your population. It's and true. then when they've gotten to a certain point, maybe that's when you have your next round of, of litters. I don't know. I'm just, I'm hypothesizing that there could sure, be some, sure. some cyclical nature to the farm itself that's uh, helping this to burn itself out. And bats are known to hibernate. And sure. so I, I wonder if these Although, bats hibernate. Gu- uh, Guangdong is really warm. No, I know that. But is that the permanent home for this bat or are they seasonal? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Peter would know this. Peter Dusak yeah. would know this, I think. Lin Fa would also know it. I found <laughs> a, right. a little bit of information about uh, weaning piglets, and it's sort of okay. an economic discussion, but they talk about 21 days versus 28 days, and yeah, okay. then, yeah. you know, yeah. that gives you a ballpark. So I guess it takes a couple of days to get enough, five days to get enough protection against this virus. Uh, five days right. of... Um, colostrum. Th- colostrum, thank you. Uh, mm-hmm. They also isolate virus. They they uh, isolate. They took some intestinal tissue homogenase. They put it in vero cells. They get virus out, which they confirm by sequencing and immunofluorescence. Then they say, can we find a receptor for this? A number of coronavirus receptors are known. <clears throat> they take cells that produce each one of them, and none of them can be infected by this virus, so it's a different virus from mm. the known ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you're curious, known receptors for coronaviruses include angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, that's for SARS, aminopeptidase N for uh, like human coronaviruses, and dipeptidyl peptidase for MERS coronavirus. These are all very interesting. These are cell surface enzymes that are involved in, in, in peptidase activity in the gut, right? Isn't that interesting? And the viruses bind to them and get in. Yeah. But not uh, this. Sads uses something, something else. else. Something else. Oh, they also did some al- animal challenge experiments. Pathogen-free piglets infected with a tissue homogenate. Two days after infection, three out of seven animals died. Wow, two days? Yeah, boy. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. Wow. And they died from diarrheal disease? They just say they died, but I would assume it is because that's the disease we're talking about here. Right. That's, that is a quick death from diarrhea. Then they yep. said, you know, one of their control animals died. And they said, ah. that was the one animal that did not receive colostrum because we didn't have enough. Ah. Ha. Wow. That's interesting. So even, I, I don't know what it died of. They don't say, right? Mm-hmm. No. But I wonder if uh, the, their experiment was like, not, not, well, maybe they had the control pigs in the same <laughs> cage as, right. the, as well, the others. Well, they're know. not in cages, perhaps. I mean, it was a, 
one of the big reasons why piglets die in, in indoor pig farms is because when the mother gives birth, mm-hmm. she she rolls over on them. Yeah, right. Yes, I've heard that too. And they are quite large. They're very large. And Stephanie used to work with them at Ohio State. Wow. I always said to her, I imagine you lifting up 600-pound sows. <laughs> I've only worked with one pig in my whole life. That was at I, Rockefeller. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm insulted. <laughs> <laughs> it, it raised quite a, a stir, though, unfortunately. I think I've told this story before, but, uh, you know, Robert Shope used to work at Rockefeller, and he, he had pigs also because he was interested in a virus that could be transmitted from pig to pig through the egg of Ascaris sum, which is the right. nematode parasite, right? So he would give his pigs away to the workers after he finished working with them. Oh, and they wow. loved him because they'd take him home and he could feed a family of four on a pig for about a two weeks. Oh my gosh. Not a good idea had, probably, right? It, not a good idea, but that's what he did. And he was very popular mm-hmm. among the animal care workers. So I, I had one pig and I infected it with trichinella, of course. And then I slaughtered the pig and uh, bled it out first. And then the workers all stood around. They said, oh, boy, here's somebody else that's working with pigs. We can get some more pigs. And I said, no, you can't eat this one. This is this has got worms. He says, no, no, the other pig had worms, too. I said, this is a different worm. <laughs> well, couldn't they just freeze it, Dixon? <laughs> they could, but what if they didn't? And then they got sick. And then they said, where'd you get that pig from? Oh, I got it from Rockefeller from that investic. Are you kidding? I don't think you're allowed to do that. I think Shope was way off limits for doing that. Yeah, I think so too. But I was very unpopular with the animal care people. By the that. way, Dixon, these pigs challenged, they died of watery diarrhea, rapid weight loss, and intestinal it's lesions. Incredible. So, yes, incredible. Two, day, two days, yes. So they, incredible. They, they had atrophy of the villi. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. And they could see virus uh, replicating in the intestine. So there you go. That's the story. And I thought it was interesting because, you know, um, we have some human coronaviruses. Uh, of course, SARS and uh, MERS coronavirus, but we also have some others that uh, are the, the so-called endemic coronaviruses. They cause respiratory disease. And then we have the zoonotic coronaviruses. And there's some idea that uh, that was, I have a nice review article that I'll put a link to, although it's behind a paywall, unfortunately, but it's a review article by um, uh, Christian Drosten, who gave the talk that, inspired me to look at these papers and uh, it's called hosts and sources of endemic human coronaviruses. So, you know, there are four endemic human coronaviruses, which we've known about for some time. And um, they, he thinks they may have all originally come from bats and he, and he suggests maybe all coronaviruses come from bats and they go through an intermediary animal and then eventually get to humans. So if you think about, well, for, for one of the endemic coronaviruses, it seems to have gone from bats to camels to humans. And then another one seems to have come to humans uh, from cows, from before them rodents, and maybe before that bats. Of course, MERS comes from a bat to a camel to a human, et cetera, et cetera. So it's this interesting idea that there's a big reservoir of coronaviruses in bats, which we have seen here in this study. And maybe they, they go through an intermediary and then into humans. SARS, of course, was thought to go from a bat to a civet to humans. So the civets were sold in the open meat markets, and then they had been contaminated previously by uh, SARS coronavirus. So I think that's a cool idea that these are all in bats. They come to us by our propensity for, like, this pig farm story, right? He says mm-hmm. here, mm-hmm. Uh, contact with domestic animals may have, may be an essential uh, element in human acquisition of most or all con- endemic coronaviruses. And of course, the ep- uh, the epidemic ones as well, the SARS and MERS seems to be the same thing. So many camels are infected with uh, MERS corona, but, you know, throughout Africa, but in most places, uh, they don't transmit it to uh, humans. It's quite interesting. The coronas are very interesting. Well, they don't yeah. kiss their camels in all those other places. Yeah. Remember that. <laughs> it's probably true. I saw a picture on Instagram this morning of someone kissing his camel. I had, I had the, I had the, I was going to say this is a good way to get MERS, but I decided not to. Oh, no, please, don't please, <laughs> don't kiss a <at> bat. <laughs> we'll stay away from them, right? All right, so there's our stories for today. Those are fascinating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's do a couple of emails. 
gambling rights. Dear Twiv, a measles scare has been reported in the San Jose area. Re- being re- he sends a link to a Mercury News article. It's being reported at the Google offices. Mm-hmm. Google employees may have been exposed after a San Mateo resident who was infected came into the Mountain View headquarters. Mm-hmm. There are outbreaks uh, in many places. I think uh, Cambling, yes, Cambling also wrote that there's one in L.A. coming out of the airport. So there you go. Um, it's unfortunate. That's it. Just review a, an adult who's never been vaccinated against measles suddenly encounters measles. What's the worst thing that can happen? Death. Yeah, you could die. Yep. Right. You get an encephalitis, right? Yes. Yes. That's right. So how come that isn't being advertised very highly? Uh, it, <laughs> because it, it is. It is. People don't listen. They got other. Yeah. They got They're just other sh- shutting their ears to that piece yeah. of data. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's kind of sad. That's very sad. That's, that's I, I, I heard a, I heard a, or read a, a an anti-vax rap at one point where somebody said something like, uh, you know, there's a one in a thousand chance. I, I I may have these numbers wrong, but and 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 the disease wrong. But it was like one in a thousand chance of uh, dying from the disease, and a one in a million chance of uh, having a complication from the vaccine. I'm not going to take that one in a million chance. <laughs> exactly. You know, that's the that's the kind of exactly. thinking we're talking. That's the kind of thinking we're talking. That's about. Exactly right. It's nonsense. Well, that's kind of a natural selection, though, isn't it? As long as they haven't had kids yet. Well, that's the problem. It's the kids who end up paying for this. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm sure that's right. Yeah, but other kids get infected. Um, yeah. yeah. As well and they, not- right, and the vaccine is not perfect. So kids who would have benefited from herd immunity if everybody was vaccinated are now exposed. Even though they got vaccinated, they're, they're not fully protected unless other people are also vaccinated. Mm. Yeah. Um, Dixon. I- sure. Anthony writes, Atlanta... Atlanta meteorologist responds to death threats after masters in eruption. Uh, Rich, are you uh, susceptible to that kind of a thing? <laughs> I know you're a golfer. <laughs> no. That's a weather-related thing. And if you don't get off the golf course, you know, you're going to die unless you're uh, – what's the guy's name that got hit twice by lightning? A professional golfer? You know him? No. no. Come on. Yeah, you, you'd know his name if I mentioned it. And. Um, he was uh, real liked among all the golfers, and um, oh, I can't think of his name right now. It doesn't matter. But uh, finish the email. You, finish the email. How can you? Um, your weather critics are Lee Trevino. That's the one. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, that's right. Your weather critics are certainly subdued compared three times. to the golf. The golf fans are three times. Oh my god! <laughs> By the way, Rich, do you know what you call a nine iron? Uh, no. What? It's a weapon of grass destruction. <laughs> so he says your weather critics are certainly subdued compared to. Golf. I read that. I you read, read that. that. Yeah. Okay. I did read that. Yes. Hey, yeah. Rich. So there's a there's a good uh, golf joke as that is um, if uh, uh, if there's uh, a thunderstorm around, what you do is uh, hold take your one iron out of your bag and hold it up in the air. <laughs> Because even God can't hit a one iron. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. So I guess this uh, this meteorologist re- was reporting on the I, the Twitter link doesn't do me any good. Yeah, I think was it's reporting the wrong one. on the was reporting on the masters, and which I yeah. guess they interrupted because of a tornado threat. Exactly, and he got threatened by people in return. Mm. Crazy. Yeah, there were um, some tornado possibilities on the the Sunday of the Masters. Oh, you were you were in at Georgia, this, right? I was not. I was back, but I had friends who had a concert that afternoon, and uh, yeah. So, our, our friend Richard DDS sends a link to the Falcon Heavy launch and landing, oh, which yeah. is very cool. Uh, mm-hmm. This is very cool because this is a perspective <laughs> on this I hadn't seen. It's a, I guess, an amateur photographer Mm -hmm. who uh filmed this thing and uh it's great because it shows in one shot the whole thing 
of the launch and the separation of the boosters and then follows the boosters back down and lands. And there's a little clip at the end from another camera angle that shows the, both the boosters landing. But it's a, it's a perspective I hadn't seen before, and it's, it's amazing. The whole thing is so, amazing. So, Rich, in light of government spending and grants uh, being tighter and everything else, are you still in favor of going to the moon? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, it just, <laughs> you know, uh, there needs to be more money in science in general. Okay. So I would, I would, I can't, I can't make those, I can't make those decisions. I think we ought to do it all. <laughs> oh, okay. you, you know, last, uh, my pick last week was this autobiography of Stan Prusner. Oh yeah. And at the end, which I hadn't gotten to last week but I did this week, uh, he says, you know, a huge number of Americans have prion diseases. You know, they're all, all these degenerative neurological diseases, including Alzheimer's and many others, Parkinson's, huge yeah. number. And the amount of money NIH spends on the research is hardly anything. It's amazing. It, disproportionate. So he says, you know, you can make all kinds of vaccines and drugs and you can live to a hundred, but you're increasing your chance of getting one of these degenerative di diseases because we're not supposed to live that long, but we should be working on it. And he's right. Hardly any money, money goes to, uh, to work on that. Okay. Alan, can you take Mark's? Sure. Mark writes, dear unencapsidated twiv humans. I hope this is a unique salutation <laughs> to you. Altruistic researchers, podcast communicators, and emerita. Is that the proper plural form of emeritus? I'm ready to give a specialized public service announcement. This is for listeners born between 1957 and 1963, and it concerns measles vaccination. The CDC's website recommendation for adult measles vaccination is inconsistent. On one page, it indicates no need for people born after 1957. On another page, it indicates people born before 1963 should consider adult age vaccination, quote, absent proof of vaccination, end quote. My infant vaccination records no longer exist. Do any of yours? In May, I will be traveling for vacation. I will transit through New the New York metropolitan area, which has an active measles epidemic, and spend time sealed in an airborne viral and microbial exchange chamber. Many know of these devices by their common name, airplanes. I vaguely remember the symptoms from having mumps and German measles, a.k.a. rubella, as a child. I have stronger memories from when my younger brothers develop developed these infections. My twin and I... Uh, scared and tormented them with exaggerated stories about disfiguring progressions of their diseases. Listeners with several siblings will certainly understand and probably partook in this behavior. Measles vaccination is almost universally administered in a trivalent vaccine, MMR, which confers protection against measles, mumps, and rubella. It is possible to get an MMR shot at other places than your doctor's office. Many pharmacies provide MMR and other vaccinations, such as flu, in a, as a convenient walk-in service. In my area, pharmacies like CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, listed alphabetically to not show preference, are such providers. So, too, is the county health department. I received the first two injections today as I write this letter. The vaccine cost is covered under my health plan's drug benefit. Um, interested listeners should check their own plans. For those put off by their provider's voice response system, which is designed to send you down an automated self-service rat hole for routine issues, I have found that dropping an F-bomb in the form of I need help from an effing live attendant almost always transfers you to a live helpful person. Uh, I ask for an effing operator is the way that I get those. But um, in the California Bay Area, one paying out of pocket would spend $100 to $125 for a shot depending on the provider. Finally, the weather. It is spring here in California, and the weather over Easter weekend was sunny with clear skies and temperatures in the mid to upper 70s Fahrenheit or 24 to 27 Celsius. The grass on the mountains around the bay is dark green, not the bright green of young, vibrantly growing grass, but the darker color of grasses starting to seed. In a few weeks, the California weather will render them brown on their way to golden color in the summer season. I hope I got a few laughs from your listeners. All the best. I, I laugh. It's funny. Yeah, that's good. I think Thank it's you. not a bad idea to get uh, another... MMR vaccine. If you're worried of going through places where there's measles and if it keeps increasing, yeah, sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the description of the uh, springtime in California. It brings mm -hmm. back good. very vivid pictures for me. That's very poetically put, too. I think it the is. prose is, it reads very well. Rich Condit, can you take the next one? Trudy writes, Dear Twivers, the recent Twix discussions about the New York vaccine mandate and whether it is ethical to enforce such a mandate reminded me 
of a book I read recently titled Terrible Typhoid Mary, and she gives a link. Uh, As suggested by the title, the book chronicles the story of Typhoid Mary and all the controversies surrounding her quarantine. At the time, there was no vaccine against typhoid fever, so the only way the medical and legal officials knew how to protect the public from Mary was by isolating her from others. When reading this book, one develops mixed feelings about the morality of such an act in view of Mary's constitutional rights, particularly because it was a, it eventually became clear that she was not the only asymptomatic carrier of the bacterium. However, she was the first one to be identified and as such, uh, as such, and the only one to be isolated from the public following her diagnosis. I suppose the main reason for this was because she was the only known character who made a living by cooking for others and hence yes. exacerbated the spread of the disease. One may reason that Mary could have found an alternative profession. However, it turns out that she was a very good cook, (laughs) enjoyed what she did, and was very well compensated for it. She tried her hand at other jobs, such as doing laundry, but the work was much harder and didn't pay as well. I can completely understand why she would be motivated to go back to cooking, especially since she herself had never been sick and didn't seem to understand the science behind her carrier status. In the end, she lived out her life in extreme loneliness, and I must admit I felt terrible for her. I highly recommend this book. It is well written and provides some great present-day analogies. And for the record, I'm highly in favor of the New York vaccine mandate, just in case you were wondering. Regards, Trudy. Great. Typhoid Mary actually worked at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital for a while. Yeah. Oh, as a cook? Uh, I believe so. Hmm. Did you have Great. Did you get typhoid, Dixon? <laughs> it's just a little before my time, but there aren't much things now before my time. So, no, I was not alive at that moment in time. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Kathy, can you take Joyce's, please? Yes. Joyce writes, Dear TWIV team, thanks very much for a great podcast. As microbiologists and people who love and respect science, we all know that climate change is on a path to increasing disease rates and devastating the planet. Young people around the world are striking for climate action and climate justice. They know their future is at stake, just like the future of all of us. An article has been written in Science Magazine, and there is an effort now to get scientists and scholars from around the world to sign an open letter. Please sign it and share the link with your institution, business, university, as well as friends and family. Encourage scholars from all disciplines, not just scientists, to sign it. The goal is to get over a million scientists and scholars to sign on. And he... Uh, she gives a link to the article and a link to sign the letter. And while you're thinking about the subject, I encourage you to visit an, another link, citizen, citizensclimatelobby.org, to see how you can help in the effort to pass legislation that will go a long way to solving the climate, climate crisis and giving us a positive future. Sincerely, Joyce. I did that before I went on podcast today. You, you signed up? I did. Very good. Let's see, we have another email from Richard DDS, who sends a video, phage therapy, pretty good communication. And this is a video about the the lady whose husband was dying, um, and she looked up phage therapy and got some for him and saved his life. And of course, Mm. that is the story of TWIV 502. Cool. Which we did on Texas A&M. Remember, everyone, those people over there in the Phage uh, Center, they had participated in this, and they told us uh, the story, basically. So, Richard, go back to TWIV 502 and hear it right from the horse's mouth, (laughs) so to speak. Ryan gives us a bunch of links about uh, the measles outbreak. Right now, CDC reports it's the largest outbreak since 2000 when Measles was declared eradicated in the U.S. Huh, How about right. that? Exactly. And let's be clear here. This is primarily because of the anti-vaccination movement. Okay? Mm-hmm. You need to get is. vaccinated. Yes, you, you should. There's nothing negative about a measles vaccination. Oh, dear. We've been saying this a lot, but I'm, I'm afraid that our listeners are all the, all the converted. Yeah, right? we're, yeah. Rich, yeah Rich, they're the choir. Rich, can you take uh, the, the next one there from Johnny? Johnny writes, howdy, Dr. R. She means everybody. I must say that it was an honor and fun 
to have Rich come by the office. A uh, little hiatus here. We didn't actually, we alluded to this, but we didn't actually talk about it on right. uh, a visit to uh, Boston a month or so ago. I spent a day and went into Cambridge and uh, bummed around and made a special effort to go by uh, Johnny. Johnny's a regular listener and writer uh, by her uh, pediatrics office. She's a pediatrician, and I spent uh, a couple hours with her, and I had a, a really a, a really fun time. So she goes on. Everyone was on their uh, company's com- company's coming best behavior. <laughs> Next time, maybe we can arrange noontime didactic and lunch, and invite all our favorite infectious disease friends. Please know that there is an open invitation to the inimical TWIV, TWIP, TWIM, etc. hosts and contributors. <laughs> uh, Rich has my contact info, uh, info and some pictures from the office and our lab. And Kathy did uh, post, uh, I believe, somewhere the wonderful measuring stick she has uh, in her laboratory oh, yes. that you can stand up against, uh, stand up against, and see if you're as tall as Yoda or uh, Chewbacca, or several other uh, celebrities. Chewbacca just wanted. died, by the way. Yes. No. Uh, lastly, Vincent, you wouldn't know, but we share January 2nd as our birthdays. <laughs> Best day of the year, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I'm old enough to always take January 2nd off, and now, if I choose, <laughs> the 3rd, 4th, and more <laughs> off, too. Hope you're enjoying be a, being a sexagenarian and the ride on Route 66, it gets better. <laughs> to you and Al, stay well warmly, Johnny. P.S. It isn't actually so warm here. <laughs> 10 C, gray and raining. Right. Yeah, right. I had a great visit with Johnny. That was fun. Cool. I wonder if earlier, anyone... Go ahead. I was just going to say, earlier I didn't give the temperature in C, but it's 9 C here. Or 10 C reminded me of that. Mm. Anybody else have January 2nd birthday? No I mean. How about out there in, in Twivland? Twivland. Ah. We had an administrator here for many years who had January 2nd birthday. All right, there's one more email I want to read because next week we're not recording, I believe. Um, we're going to have a canned episode, but that doesn't mean it's not good. Canned episodes are good. Just that um, – there are no we preservatives. Very well. We don't use any Letters. preservatives in our canned <laughs> episodes. Um, we don't have fresh letters. <laughs> well, you know. That's right. <laughs> May, it's May 10th next Friday, right? Oh, I have to go right. to Princeton for a textbook meeting. Right. I'm sorry. It happens. Yeah. This is from Kate. Dear Twivers, thank you for your outstanding podcast. There is no other podcast on the internet done by experts in a biological discipline that I can find. Every discipline should communicate with the public students and colleagues the way that the Twivers do. I don't know how you have the time to do it every week. It is very, very useful. I teach at a small liberal arts college or sinus college where reading the primary literature is part of the biological curriculum from the student's first year of study. We continue to reinforce this style of learning throughout their education. Do you know who went there, by the way? Uh, um, oh... Yeah, I'll get You don't even I know. I guess you don't know either. I just, I just, no, I knew it, and then the thought went out as soon as you said something. That's what happens, <laughs> Gerald, Dixon. Gerald, Gerald Edelman. Gerald Edelman went oh. to your sinus college. He's, he's a Nobel so laureate. If you go to our sinus major. Yes, he is. Sinus major? Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> if you go to our sinus, do you have an our sinus major? Yes, and a minor, no, too. But you might <laughs> have your sinus infection. <laughs> he's talking about the constellation, Dixon. Yes. Well, that's okay. I was talking about a disease. I just want to make sure. Okay. Uh, We uh, continue to reinforce this style of learning throughout their education. I discovered TWIV this year and immediately incorporated it into my 400-level virology course. We use TWIV in a few ways. One, I use TWIV podcasts to identify new papers to use in class. Two, at the beginning of the semester, I assign some of the papers that are discussed on the TWIV podcast to all of the students in the class to read. I tell the students to listen to TWIV so that they have help in interpreting the paper. I write homework questions on the paper for the students to address. We then discuss the answers to the questions in class. As an alternative to the questions, I have them fill out this table called Figure Facts, invented by my colleague Jennifer Round and Malcolm Campbell at Davidson College. It encourages the student to slowly dissect each table 
and figure in a paper and record the goals, methods, and results of each table or figure. Here's a link to the paper. Three, after a few weeks into the semester, students start to present papers in the class. They are responsible for presenting background information on the virus in the paper and then leading the class discussion on the paper. They write and I edit the class discussion questions. If there is a TWIV podcast associated with the paper, I recommend that they listen to it. TWIV helps everyone to understand the papers much better. It boosts their confidence and mine to hear the TWIVers say that they don't know why someone did a particular experiment a particular way. In addition, I tell the students that they should read with their computers open so that they can look up unfamiliar words or techniques. Here, here. It is also good that the students have examples of famous scientists looking things up that they don't know, as the Twivers look things up very frequently. Absolutely. My students report that Twiv is extremely helpful. Oh, good. The philosophy of bringing science to the public demonstrated by Twiv is wonderful. As I said above, I have not found another discipline in which this is done nearly as well. As so many of you listener, your listeners say, keep up the good work. Thank you, Kate Goddard Doms, Associate Professor of Biology at Ursinius College. Ursinus. 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 I said it right at the top. Ursinus. You did. You did. You did. And um, it turns out that she's a friend of somebody that I sing with, and that's how this connection oh, wow. happened. She uh, sent the friend of mine information and raved about the podcast, and the friend passed it on to me, and then I wrote to Kate and said, can, can I send this to Vincent, or, or do you want to write your own letter? So she wrote her own Where letter. Where is her sinus located? Uh, it's outside of Philly. Oh. Just, it's a suburb of Philly. Okay. And there's a funny, if if you look up uh, how to pronounce uh, ursinus, there's a funny link to an April Fool's thing that they published in 2015 about changing the name of it to Bovinus College because that way people would be able to pronounce it and not call it Ursinus, your sinus, your sinus, and so forth. Yeah. So, Dixon, this kind of lever, letter I'm going to use when I pursue some fundraising. Good. Absolutely. To show yeah. that we are doing a service for colleges and universities everywhere. It's Perfect testimony. And um, we do it because we love it, and we love teaching. Right, right. right. By the way, I was unaware of the fact, I'm just surfing now because I'm at home, that (laughs) Gerald Edelman died in 2014. I had not realized that. He did? Yep, that's what it says here. So he used to be a Rockefeller, right? And then he went to... Yep, he went to Scripps, as I recall. Hmm. It says where he did. Do you know what he's famous for doing? Yeah, he sequenced the IgM molecule. Yeah. The first, IgG molecule, sorry. IgG first molecule. one to do that way back when uh, protein <laughs> sequencing was new. And now it's a high school bi- biology project. <laughs> <laughs> it's That's true. He was born in Ozone Park. Yep. Hmm. Wow. Yep. Local guy. And of course, he got the Nobel Prize. He also almost became a professional violin player instead of a physician, or instead of a, of a scientist, rather. Alan, what do you have as a pick for us this week? My pick is a um, this link that I'm providing goes to a PLOS Biology article, which you can read online, and they in turn link to this application, this online application um, that they, uh, uh, let's see, it gave me a security risk warning, um, <laughs> except the risk is <laughs> indeed <laughs> the format of their oh, they're their link is currently broken, but hopefully they'll have that up again. Um, the The app is called Plots of Data, um, and these folks, Martin Postma and Joachim Goodhart, have developed this thing that you can plug your data into, and it, it uses um, the, uh, the computer language R behind the scenes, I think, and it does uh, some nice graphic uh, design setup. You can... Um, uh, so you can pull data from various sources. Uh, they give some examples, and it's just a just a really handy once the site is back up. Just a really handy tool um, that uh, that allows you to to process things conveniently inside a web browser. Mm, neat, very cool. Rich Condit, what do you have? So as we as I mentioned earlier in the episode, I just came back from a <clears throat> visit to Florida. And I have a couple of uh, links that uh, came out of that visit. Um, I have a, a friend uh, in Florida who has apparently a, a heritable tremor that shows up in adulthood. Uh, this person's father had it. 
uh, and all and three of uh, the sibs have it. And uh, one sib, it's uh, so uh, pronounced that it's debilitating. Uh, this person basically can't eat or do a lot of other things that require your hands. Uh, and was treated at the University of uh, Florida by deep brain stimulation, and it worked a miracle, basically wow. Wow. Uh, a cure. Uh, and so my friend gave me uh, links. These, these are obviously, if you look at them, uh, to some extent promotional, but also uh, quite informative. One is a TEDxUF talk by the uh, physicians involved. It's a team called How to Control the Brain. And it talks about deep brain uh, stimulation and it gives some nice video of your, when this is, when the procedure is done, you're awake, okay? So that they, because they're doing mm -hmm. this to some extent empirical. So they're implanting an electrode in your brain and monitoring your symptoms at the same time. And when they hit the right spot and stimulate it, your tremor goes away. Um, and the, so they know they've got it and then they can lock it down. Um, so they, uh, show some examples of that. And there's also, uh, once again, a promotional, but nevertheless, nice, uh, video of an interview with the, uh, surgeon, uh, involved, which struck me as sort of same as, you know, we interview people and ask them how they got into this. And he gives a lot of his background, which I thought was interesting. At any rate, um, this is deep brain stimulation and it's uh, uh, very interesting. And they also raise some ethical issues as well that are worth considering. Hmm. So there you go. Hmm. Hmm. Speaking of TEDx, so I stayed at a Marriott in Rotterdam and you know the the thing you put on your door, you know, do not disturb tag, right? <laughs> right. The one right. they had was do not disturb, I'm watching TEDx. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And so I thought, what would it cost for them to have one that says, do not disturb, I'm listening to TWIV? Listening to TWIV. <laughs> yes, that's right. It would probably cost a lot, right? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Dixon, what do you have? Um, I've recently become associated with a group that calls itself Oceanics. Uh, it's an organization that is addressing the potential sea level rise that's about to occur over the next, let's say, 100 years. Uh, the leader of this group is the former sustainability officer for the um, <clears throat> the French Polynesian island um, community and has a deep interest in seeing what happens to these people after the ocean exceeds the limit of their countries. Um, he's He was stationed in Tahiti for 30 years. I must they moved tell you. to Queens. They did. <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, the, the organization, I, I, uh, I was very skeptical at first when I was asked to consider um, working. In fact, Vincent, I think you met this guy as he came into my office, my, my outer office to talk with me. Um, name is Mark Collins. But it turns out that we had a one-day long meeting at the United Nations and afterwards, if you want publicity like they got, I mean, I don't know how they did it, but over one, 200 news services and organizations picked up on this idea within a week after the announcement from the United Nations that, that this was going to be an initiative that they fully supported and thought that it was the only reasonable solution to countries uh, throughout the Pacific Ocean and, and all coastal cities, basically. And... Um, it's radical. I must say it's radical, but it's got the backing of Arup, uh, the um, uh, architecture firm Big, which has designed a number of, of large uh, projects throughout the world. Um, MIT uh, has a group that's interested in um, o ocean and um, 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 I'm blocking on the, the, the specific name for this group, but they, they handle everything to do with engineering in the ocean to installing, you know, um, um, oil rig platforms all the way to building jetties for cities and protection barriers and stuff like this. And they think this is the most useful thing that they've been involved with in a hundred years. So I just, you know, brought it up for your attention. So this is a Didn't floating Kevin city. Foster do this movie? This is a floating. <laughs> yeah. This is a, yes. say that again. <laughs> I said, didn't Kevin Costner do this movie? Yeah, you're laughing, but the producer of that movie was at this meeting. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Then it's you know it's become a cult movie. Yes, 
people love this movie for the wrong reasons, of course. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I heard I it's that, not a very good movie, right? Up there with it's Howard the Duck. Not a very good movie. It's not a very good movie. So this, this Dixon, this is this a rendering, or does this thing actually exist? It's, it's a rendering. This is, no, that's a rendering. This is the... Um, the architecture firm big that actually made the rendering but what they're doing now is they're going to develop a prototype of one of those units that you see there this is what you're looking at is designed for 10,000 people mm-hmm. and one of those units that you can separate off from it uh will will house about 300 people and so they want to build into this unit all of the zero um footprint uh technologies that removes you from the fossil fuel grid, uh, the water grid, the food grid, which is what I'm... Once the construction is done. Yeah. yeah. Depend on all those grids for the construction to happen, though. You have to do that. <laughs> so they're going to be building it. What happens when a cyclone comes through here? I've been thinking the same thing. Weather is a problem. Depends on where you locate these things, right? Well, so yeah, you, right. You'll never, you'll never guess where they want to put the first one. No, they want to put it in San Francisco Bay. Of mm-hmm. course. So that's not going to be a hurricane problem. That's where all the hype is. Is that going to interfere with the uh, ocean-going tra- traffic? No, they're going to locate it probably on the east coast, of, the eastern shore. I can almost San guarantee Francisco. it'll get whacked by at least a few ships in its history, but it, it looks like an interesting <laughs> idea. Oh, no, no. I Listen, Alan, I agree with you. There's a lot of issues to be addressed, and the, not the least of which is if you're going to raise 10,000 people on this place, they're going to be of all different ages, including infants. How would you prevent them from just walking off the side of one of these structures into the water? Mm. So you've got a lot of other things to think about besides just living in a city in this one. Mm. But it's exciting because you could um, – uh, James Cameron is involved in it, believe it or not. So he couldn't be at the meeting, though, because he was out filming Avatar 2. But um, – <laughs> But he's very concerned about what so he'll do the movie after this thing sinks. No, no, I maybe, <laughs> maybe you know. Sorry, I shouldn't be. I, I, I actually, I think, I think this is a neat idea. I shouldn't be uh, just poking fun at it. It, it, it is a very cool idea. I'm going to tell you that this guy Mark um, Collins carefully selected the release um, of this idea to the press and highly selected those people that were. Uh, out there because he didn't want that reaction to right. begin with. Mm-hmm. Once you start to think about it, I mean, I was, come on, okay, tell me about it. I think this is a crazy idea. P.S. It is a crazy idea. But it's such a crazy idea that people actually think it could work. So now we're going to try to see what happens next. Now, you know, if you ever add a number of these, you know, say they work and they're more and more, then they're going to be pirates who come and just trash the place. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you have a That's what it is about. Yeah. Let me tell you, you've got a ton of problems. There's, there's lots of countries now that almost ten uh, percent of their population live on water. Yeah, this is. I mean, the the problem this is addressing is um, where uh, I'm, me especially, are, are chuckling about it. But um, there is a, there is a very very serious problem that a lot of entire countries and sections of countries in the world are going to be underwater mm. in right. in a matter of a few decades, and this is true. There need to be solutions that don't involve abandoning those countries, ideally, and this is right. a this is a potential approach. You got it. That's the reason why it's got legs. Yeah, mm. the re- the renderings are cool. Least, yeah, they are. They're very pretty. The renderings are great. Yeah, yeah, they are. They mm-hmm. are. Kathy, what do you have? I picked something from uh, Michigan Engineering. Uh, this one is from Material Science and Engineering. And it's this really cool thing where they've come up with a coating that makes ice come off of large surfaces in whole sheets. And so it came about with a discussion evidently between this material science and engineering professor and somebody in mechanical engineering. It has to do with um, the fact that most coating research focuses on lowering adhesion strength. But this one uses a second strategy something about lower interfacial toughness. And that encourages cracks to form between ice and the surface. And instead of breaking the surface adhesion, which uh, require, requires tearing a whole sheet free, the crack only breaks and along the leading edge. And once that crack starts, then it can quickly spread across the ice surface. And so there's this really cool one-minute video. That's all you have to watch. <laughs> yes. um, and of this guy holding a, a metal sheet uh, with ice on it and uh, using the one kind of coating 
uh, it doesn't come off and using this new coding, it does. Mm. And so there's a lot of uh, cool applicability uh, for this, but uh, the article is a, a nice explanation of it for those who want to yeah. know a little more about the material science this, engineering. This, by the way, could be a huge breakthrough for aviation. Mm, yeah. That's what yeah. I was thinking. Right. Yeah. Ice, yeah. Exactly. ice is exactly. a massive problem for aircraft, and the systems for dealing with it are incredibly expensive and, and lots of moving parts and failure-prone, and people, I mean, thousands of people have died because of ice on airplane wings. And this thing, I mean, if you can True. if you can paint the wing so that it's like this coated plate that the guy just tilts and the ice shears straight off it, uh, that would be amazing. Yeah, so... Um, the way the advantage of designing coatings this way, uh, based on their fundamental mathematical properties, as it says, is that uh, you can adjust the <laughs> recipe to create a variety right. of different coatings for different applications. Uh, and what they have to work on right now is making it more durable. Yeah, that was the other thing. Is this seems like it was a it was a rational what I would call a rational design process in the yes. in the like the drug industry would try to do. Only in this case, it worked. And they yes. they planned what what characteristics they wanted in this molecule, and then they made it, and they it actually does what they yeah. hoped it to. Yeah, yeah. So the wind the wind farm idea is also a great idea here. Wind farm, it's fantastic, yes. mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic. Yeah. My it's a great video. Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. My pick is a autobiography by Svante Pabo. It's called Neanderthal Man in Search <laughs> of Lost Genomes. An autobiography. <laughs> well, it's a it's his, it's his career. It is his career, and yes. But it's, it's he's the not, autobiography is not, not of Neanderthal Man. No, no, no. It's of Svante out. Pabo. <laughs> um, and so Svante Pabo, of course, is a pioneer in getting DNA from ancient samples. He's perfected a lot of the methodology. The use of clean rooms really came from him. And um, this is his story starting from his... Uh, really hard to get him to sign those consent forms. Too. <laughs> from uh, his, his young years in, in Sweden. And he, he just takes you through the, the story. And of course, it culminated in uh, the sequence of the Neanderthal genome, which he's right. well known for. But it starts with him... As a, as a PhD student, and he just he was into Egyptology, and he he always thought about could we get DNA from mummies and sequencer yeah, yeah. genomes, and he actually did an experiment. We got he bought a piece of calf liver at the uh, supermarket and dried it out to be mummified, and just showed that you could get DNA out of it. And his lab was horrified because it smelled. You know, they put it in the oven in the lab, and it smelled. <laughs> and then he the early days where he got some ancient samples of various sorts and, and did some sequencing. And in the early days, it was cloning, PCR and cloning. And um, then he got some Neanderthal bone. He got a small piece of a Neanderthal bone. He got he was friendly with uh, museum curators and so forth. And But then, of course, th these bones are contaminated with lots of other DNAs, right, of humans who have touched them. He tells a story. He goes to a museum once, and he asks the guy if the if this bone, I think it was a Neanderthal bone, had been coated with varnish, and he said the guy picked it up and licked it. Because he said if it were varnished, the, the saliva wouldn't be absorbed as you see it is now. And so he's like, oh my gosh. So <laughs> the, D, the DNA in these samples is typically only 3% Neanderthal or whatever it is that you're looking for. And the rest is bacteria and fungi and plants and, and curators. Uh, curators, curators and so forth. Right. Yeah, because they don't they, they don't keep it clean. And uh, anyway, it's a great story. And of course, what really revolutionized it was being able to do next generation sequencing. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, this is the era when 454 began with the first uh, next generation high throughput sequencer. And he, uh, he recognized the value of it. And he went to the company and made a pitch uh, to sequence the Neanderthal genome. And um, they were very excited. And it cost something like five million dollars that was the sequencing bill from 454 to sequence and of course he didn't know where to get the money anyway it's a great story and he's a really good writer and he puts really good personal touches to it so i highly recommend it so neanderthal man and of course um i i a couple of weeks ago svante visited the university of utah and he gave a uh, a public talk and nell zeldi of course is there and he said they had originally had the public talk in an auditorium with a few hundred seats. Huh. And they announced it. And within five minutes, it sold out. 
<laughs> so they moved it to the football stadium. Right. How? Because he's well wow. known. He's well known. Yeah. Right. And so now we were supposed to do a Twivo with him, but he wouldn't do it. He's, he said he's kind of shy. And uh, but of course he's got this autobiography out there, which is uh, is all about him, many aspects of him, which you will see. Highly recommend it. It's very good. So to, this, right. together with last week's Stanley Prusiner uh, autobiography, um, this one I got. I think we were doing a pod. Oh yes, the last Twivo was about uh, Den- Denisovan uh, sequences in in human genomes, and Svante's name came up, and it was in one of the papers uh, referenced. So I bought. It's really good. I highly recommend it. Uh, we have uh, two listener picks. Johnny, uh, our friend who we had a letter from, uh, from the New York Times Magazine Lab. Two timely articles aimed primarily at the school-aged grades 1 to 12 population about vaccinations, a pro-vaccine perspective, uh, and taking charge about a teenager who testified before Congress about the importance of vaccination and a what, why, how, and cartoon about herd immunity, page 5, my listener pick. I have to get a link for that, but it's the New York Times magazine i think a week or two ago right two weeks maybe and from sheena uh she writes i subscribe to an npr history podcast and the latest episode covered the history of vaccine compliance in the u.s i thought you and the other twivers might find it interesting she provides a link for that that's cool Mm. yeah and sheena is in zurich she's a postdoc in the laboratory of professor plukthun the university of zurich i met her when i was there on my trip hi sheena Thanks for that. And that is TWIV546. You can find it at microbe.tv slash TWIV and, of course, on any podcast player. And if you do listen on a podcast player, we just ask that you subscribe. That way we know who's listening. And, uh, of course, if you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially, microbe.tv slash contribute. And, of course, send your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. Dixon de Pommier is at parasiteswithoutborders.com and livingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Pleasure. Dixon, did you fish this week? Last week. How was it? It was great. All right. This is the time. This is prime time. Good. Next week, too. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. And I'm going to steal Kathy's line. This is a lot of fun. It is. <laughs> I learned a lot. It is. We all do. I, I totally agree. It's fun. We learn a lot. And other people apparently learn as well. I can't tell you how many people at this meeting thanked me for TWIV, the yeah, virology that's meeting, yeah, to that's see great. all these mostly young people. <laughs> Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. He's on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank ASV and ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>